Uh, good, morning. good morning. My name's Sean Pallotta, and this is my wife, Melissa. Hi. Uh, this morning, we wanted to uh, kick it off and really continue on a lot of things Abner said. There are a lot of things he said last night that we'll pick up on in our, our word today, what the Lord gave us to share. We want to share more about our prayer journey and our journey as a family in ministry and how the Lord's kind of knit us together in ministry as a family and led us on this journey of where, you know, where he's called us to serve. So I want to start with um, scripture in Ephesians uh, 6, 18. Um, this is a translation from a Hebrew Bible that Melissa has. I don't know what translation that is. So it might be different than what you have, but it's really, really powerful the way it reads here. It says, through every prayer and humble request, by praying always in the spirit and being alert in him, by means of every perseverance and humble request concerning all the saints. So Paul is um, urging the church to continue in prayer. And he goes on to talk about how he desires their prayers. So you have this apostle of God who recognizes that the prayers of the church and the prayers of the saints for him is, is, is vital. As much as he walked in, in the power and wisdom of God, he knew he needed prayers um, from the church there in Ephesus. We want to highlight, I want to highlight a few things here in this verse. The word for prayer in this verse, and some of you Greek scholars can, can correct me on pronunciation here, but I think the word is prozuk. And it's, um, there's two parts to this word, but it's used over 100 times in the New Testament as a word for prayer. It's one of the most commonly used words in the Greek for prayer in the New Testament. And the first part of this word, pros, means uh, toward, to face toward. It, it implies closeness, an intimate relationship, um, like face-to-face -face contact. So in John 1, 1, when it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, the word with there is the word pros. So it's this very intimate face-to-face -face encounter. And the word uh, yuk is a wish, a desire, a prayer, or a vow so as if making a vow to God because of some kind of desire or um, important need that we have. Not that prayer is always about our needs, but many times, sometimes that's what we come to, right? And that's where our prayer life starts sometimes is when we really, really have a desperate need. And so an example of this in Scripture, uh, 1 Samuel 1.11 is where Hannah's praying. Um, and she makes a vow, right? And she has a desire and a need that's so intense that is she weeping? Is she's weeping? The priest thought that, you know, maybe she was uh, drunk or yeah. um, because she, her, her emotions were so intense. And it says in 1 Samuel 1.11, and she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. And we know that her prayer was answered, and she fulfilled her vow and gave her son Samuel to the service of the Lord. So this, this word, um, prazuk, that's used for prayer here, um, if you kind of combine these two different meanings of this two-part word, um, you could read it like this. It means to come face to face with God and surrender your life in exchange for his to maintain an attitude of consecration as an ongoing part of your life and be sure to give him thanks in advance for moving on your behalf. <clears throat> so we, we heard Abner talk about a few of these concepts last night, that it's, it's an ongoing part of your life, right? It's a way of life. It's a lifestyle. Um, we read, uh, if just going back to this, this scripture, it says, through every prayer. Some of, the, some of the translations say all kinds of prayer. Right? So there are different kinds of prayer that we'll talk about in Scripture. There's just a few that I'll mention here. Uh, the prayer of faith, the prayer of intercession, prayer of consecration and blessing, prayer of agreement as some examples. Um, it says praying always in the Spirit. There's never a time where we're not in a time of prayer. And actually in this Scripture it says, um, it goes on to say, being alert in Him. Right? So... It's not something we're always doing, that we're always necessarily talking or having a conversation with God, but we're alert and we're aware and it's as much listening and hearing, you know, his direction as Abner shared last night, you know, just being so silent in your spirit and just tuned into the Lord that you can just hear a still small voice, right, in the busyness of your day and everything you're doing. And you may even be 
doing something that he directed you to do, but he might need to direct your course. Like, like when he told Paul and the apostles that they were prevented from going to Bithynia, right? It was like they had to be hearing to say, all right, we're, we're going on this journey. We know where we're headed. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit says no, right? And then the, he sees in a vision this man from Macedonia and has to shift course. So it's being alert, always praying, but that doesn't mean we're always talking and we're always the one driving the conversation. Um, and yes, sometimes it, it, it mentions here there's a humble request. Um, so a few examples here, the prayer of faith. James 5.15 says, and the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. Um, I'll, I'll share a testimony a little later how um, the prayer of faith impacted my life and our life as a family when I needed just a major healing in my life. And that model of prayer was used um, by two men that really discipled me, and it was life-changing for us and our, our journey. Uh, prayer of intercession, um, just a, another example of in this scripture where it says all kinds of prayer, pray in, every, in, in all kinds of prayer. Luke 22, 31 to 32, um, Jesus is saying to Peter, Satan has asked that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. Um, so this idea of intercession really is to mediate or to be an advocate for someone, right? To stand in the gap. Um, Job even alluded to this in Job 16, 19 through 21. Uh, he said, even now my witness is in heaven. My advocate is on high. My intercessor is my friend as my eyes pour out tears to God on behalf of a man who pleads with God as one who pleads for a friend. So even Job, somehow through revelation of the Spirit, understood that he needed an intercessor in heaven to plead on his behalf because he didn't know what was happening, right? But he knew that his intercessor, his mediator, had to, had to be there between him and God. That was a revelation he would have received from God, right? That he had an intercessor, someone mediating for him on his behalf. Um, the next one is prayer of consecration. Oh, I have the mic. <laughs> Um, yeah, the prayer of consecration is number 6, 22 through 27. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites and say to them. And we were joking around last night that um, I should do this in Hebrew. So I'm going to go ahead and, and do this. So, la varekaka Adonai vishmareka. Yae Adonai panave lecha vihunecha. Yes, Adonai Penave Lecha, Veyashem Lecha Shalom. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. The fourth one is the prayer of agreement. And um, this is Matthew 18, 19, and this is actually... Um, I don't know, for those of you that don't know, I'm the intercessory prayer director for Abner Suarez for his ministry. Woohoo! hoo and, um, and this is our verse um, that we stand by, and it's, again, Matthew 18, 19. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. So that was an example of prayer of agreement. Oh, oh, you don't need to give me the mic. Oh, have we have a, a double can mic. Can you, can you hear Can you hear through this one? You hear me fine. Okay. I missed that. <laughs> um, one example I wanted to give about the prayer of consecration or the prayer of blessing is this is something that the Lord had us do in our family um, was when our children came to that, that age. So similar in, um, in Jewish family faith or Jewish tradition that you'd have a bar or bar mitzvah at around age 12, age 13. 12, age 13. So it wasn't at, exactly at that age for all our kids, but as we came to know about this, the idea of having a rite of passage, having a rite of blessing for our children, consecrating them to the Lord. This has been something that's been tremendously impactful yeah. in, our, in our family. We saw, even though our children were saved at a very young age and they're in church, there were just things that happened in their life at that time where we chose to gather with other men in the body for our sons and other women in the body for um, our daughters to, to consecrate them to the Lord. 
there was just a major shift in their life. I mean, we even saw things and patterns that um, were happening, like with our, with our sons. Maybe they'd always get attacked in terms of um, accusations, right, at church. People accusing them of things, and all of a sudden that, that just stopped at that point when, when we chose to, to, to bless them you know, with other men in the body, other women in the body of Christ. Um, it, was, it was just a tremendous change and shift in, our, in their lives. And even they'll testify to it. Our oldest son, Lenore, is here. Stand up, Lenore. I didn't get this to introduce Lenora. all our kids. <laughs> we have five children, by the way. Lenore so. is, yeah, Lenore is our second. <laughs> and so it was, um, this is just something we learned about through some other ministries. And we're coming to know as we learn more about um, our heritage, right? and Jewish tradition, and as we travel more to Israel and we're understanding the culture of what we see in scripture, right, and learning it from that perspective has just been such a tremendous impact in our lives and in our family. Um, Sorry to interrupt you. When she, said, she, she prayed that prayer of consecration, it was in a song. Mm -hmm. You know, this is something that impressed me. Do you do a lot of praying in songs, or is this something that's you know, maybe she just mentioned something about that that struck me as, as important. The fact that you're saying this. Yeah. Prayer, they do. They sing a lot of their prayers. Yeah. They do they do say them too, but a lot of them are sung. And, you know, I feel like, you know, in intercession it is so powerful to to sing. That's I don't know who was here this morning for in prayer, but we were singing, my daughter and I were singing our prayers and going back and forth and just speaking them and declaring them and singing them unto the Lord. Amen. It's very powerful. Yeah. John does that too. Yeah, I love absolutely. singing with him. Yeah. yeah, and in the scripture in Ephesians 6 where it says praying always in the spirit, I mean, sometimes for me, it'll just be singing in the spirit, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's something about it, absolutely. It's powerful. It's the sounds. There's, that there is something good. that happens in how we remember things, right? Because how many songs do we all know? How many words, the songs do we all know because it was put to, to music, right? So Even there, the ones we don't want to have in our head. There's something about how God has created us and how our mind works that, yes, putting things to song like really um, is impactful. Absolutely. Um, so just to, to summarize here what we were reading on this scripture in Ephesians 6 is uh, we're walking in a lifestyle of prayer. I mean, Abner talked about this last night. Um, as in scripture, it says, walk in the spirit, right? So you're walking in the spirit. In Jude, in verse 20, 21, it says, praying always in the spirit, keeping yourselves in love, right? right? So, so how do you stay in a... In an attitude of love, right, and not in offense, <laughs> right? And so offense doesn't easily attack you. It says they're praying always in the spirit. Keep yourself in love. Um, it's really, it mentions in the scripture just being alert, right? And we'll, I'll talk about that in a second, um, that we know his voice. Abner talked about that last, last night, just recognizing the still small voice of the Lord, right? Um, we get to that point in our lives where it's not like, sometimes you hear God really just loudly speaking to you, right? But sometimes it's not because um, you've done something wrong, but sometimes I'll just hear certain words from the Lord where it does just come and it just feels like you're, you just want to, this word is just like exploding, you know, in you as the Lord's speaking to you. Uh, and it talks about perseverance in all things in Ephesians 6. It reminds me of Romans 5, 3 through 5, where it says, um, uh, rejoice in our sufferings and suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope and hope does not disappoint because of the love of God that's poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's given to us um, so it, it is about persevering um, one thing um, that I thought about one time in relation to prayer that the Lord I just started speaking to me was, you know, we kind, of, we kind of engage or initiate in prayer in a few different ways. You know, the first one um, is just very obvious, right? We set aside time to pray. We say, we go into our prayer closet, right? Or prayer chamber, as the scripture talks about, right? Our bed chamber is really the word that's used there. And we intently sit down to pray. We take a posture of prayer. Maybe you have a certain posture. You lay on your face. You, maybe you put a prayer shawl on, right? You intently say, you know, I'm dedicating this time to prayer. 
And I think we can all relate to that. The second way um, that I felt like the Holy Spirit was showing me was that thoughts. Right? There would be times in early in my walk with the Lord, there would be times during the day where I just have these random thoughts right, about people, people I hadn't thought about in a while. And it wouldn't be till later, and I'd hear something from them, maybe a week later, and realize, wow, I was thinking about them a week ago, and I didn't do anything with that. And it wasn't a shame thing, but it's just more and more I realized that whenever I have a thought about a situation, a person, something, uh, taking that pause to say, to just speak a blessing over that person, or maybe now I pick up the phone and say, hey, I haven't talked to you in a while, how's it going? And then they might share an example of this. Uh, last week, um, I called a missionary friend of ours, and I called his um, U.S. cell phone number, thinking he would get it when he's overseas, and he, he picks up the phone and says, well, you're calling my U.S. cell phone number. Normally, I wouldn't answer this, but I'm in the States because my mom just died. And I hadn't talked to him in months. So, you know, things like that just happen. So being aware that, you know, the first way might be we, we enter and engage into prayer just the way we normally do. We just sit down and say, this is my prayer time. Other times it's just being aware, like it said in Ephesians 6, of every thought, being aware of every thought, taking every thought captive. It's not of the Lord, but every thought that may be from the Lord of a prompting to pray. It's just those arrow prayers, right? Or maybe making contact with someone if, if the Lord puts something on your mind. And the third way, we'll give some examples here. Uh, Melissa has some great examples, is Sometimes you walk out your prayers, right? The Lord puts you in a geographical place at a chronological time, right, for a purpose. Sometimes you, he may have you open your mouth. Sometimes you know you're just there, and somehow you know it makes a difference that you're, you're light in the darkness. The kingdom of God is within you, so wherever you go, you take the kingdom of God, and you take the light and the glory of God and his presence. So you know sometimes you're just walking it out. Um, Abner mentioned this when he talked about when we met. Um, I'll share more on, on that example is that, you know, it was just as divine that we were there that day, you know, when the Lord told him to go to this church in Youngstown. Um, <clears throat> Alyssa has a couple examples she's going to share on this of the idea of just the Lord sometimes has you walking out your prayers. Yeah, I feel well, like you're a walking prayer, basically. Yeah, I'm a walking prayer, that's yeah, for sure. Is. Everywhere I go, I just feel like I know that there's a reason and not to over spiritualize it but literally that we are that walking prayer and um one example was there was a young lady that came to our church and and we kind of brought her in and began to disciple her and before she had actually been saved at a meeting that we had she um, had stolen some things and um she got really convicted and she wanted to return them and she stole them from walmart and Walmart wouldn't allow her to go back in the store to return them. So I actually took them back for her in her place. So here I am, even though I'm not praying, I'm standing in, our, as her, in her behalf. And I went to Walmart and I went to go take back the things that she stole. Now Walmart wouldn't take them back, but that's another story. So then um, she wanted to go to court and I said, you know, I don't want you to go alone, I'll just go with you. So all I did was sit in that courtroom. So I'm sitting there again, I'm not necessarily praying or anything, but I'm standing in for her again. And in the end, the judge literally threw out the case. Now this is the third time she was busted for shoplifting. And there was no reason that she shouldn't have gone to jail for like two years. So, but the Lord intervened and all I was doing was standing there. So, you know, we, uh, we do that. Another example was uh, when uh, um, we went to Azusa Now out in LA, I went with Abner and my daughter and my friend um, Jess, and this was really incredible. So for those of you, those of you that don't know, I'm Jewish, um, and um, I really want to make what's called Aliyah, and that means to uh, get a dual citizenship in Israel. Um, so I would have a passport for an Israeli passport in the United States. But in 1985, the Knesset ruled that um, if you're a believer, you're no longer Jewish. So, and there's no way that I can cover that one up. I mean, it's all over my Facebook. And they, and they research you, you know. So there's no way that, that I would ever be able to make Aliyah. So, I know. So, 
So Abner and I were in line. He drags me there in line at 4.30 in the morning <laughs> to get into the stadium. And I was literally praying. I'm like, God, I need to make Aliyah. You have to make this happen. I can't do it. You just need to do it. So we, um, we, we go into the stadium, and um, I have a friend of mine. His name is Dr. Z, and he's a prayer warrior. Everybody know Dr. Z? <clears throat> so Dr. Z was there, and he's like, we need to make a prayer walk all around the stadium. I'm like, yeah, we need to do this. So he went off and decided to try to make it on his own, and he got blocked by the, um, I guess there was backstage security. So he comes back. He's all disappointed. And then, I don't know, about two hours later, the Lord says, no, we need to go now. We need to go right now. We need to do this. So I grab my daughter and my friends. There was about eight of us, maybe. And um, we go, okay, we're going to go on this prayer walk. And Dr. Z's looking at me going, okay, God told you, so you lead it. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So I just happened to have this badge because we'd been ministering at a tent. And so I had a badge on me that said I was allowed to pray for people. And for some reason, the Lord told me to put it in my purse that morning. So I had that badge, and the Lord said, take the badge out. So I took the badge out, put it around my neck, and we're off. So I'm like, okay, guys, just follow me. So we get to the first, like, security station, right? And um, I just pretended like I knew what I was doing, and I just walked right in, right? And this lady stops me and goes, excuse me, are they with you? And I said, yeah. So we just all walked in. We're like, oh, my gosh, that's great. Right? So again, here we are. We're just manifesting. Well, I mean, this was a prayer walk, but we're manifesting what God is calling us to do. And so come to this. There's another security block. And right before then, so this is the backstage security. These two cops come out of nowhere. One comes from one side. One comes from the other. And they're like walking. They're, you know, really fast. So I'm like, okay, come on, guys. Just follow, follow me. So I'm like on their tail. I'm like, we walked right into backstage security. And nobody stopped us. Nobody, not one person stopped us. And we don't know where the cops went. Like, they kind of disappeared afterwards. So we're standing in the back, and Bethel's doing worship, right, in this coliseum. And we're standing there, and the Lord says, and this is, and I'm not sharing this for anything for me, but just to encourage you. The Lord says, you are my gatekeeper. You will go where I call you to go, and you will, you will open doors when I tell you. You're going to go in. You're going to open doors, and you're going to close doors, and that's what your job is. And he showed us just by walking around the stadium. We get to the end of this. This is the best part. I think that's good. We get to the end of our walk and we're all laughing. Can you believe it? Where'd the cops go? You know, and we're, we're rejoicing in the fact we made it all the way around, right? This guy walks up to me with this white invitation. It says, holy invitation on the outside of it. And he hands it to me and he goes, the Lord pointed you out to me. I'm to help you make Aliyah. Okay? It was so powerful, right? And so I get home, and I'm contacted with all these people within a couple days, emails to help me, you know, et cetera, make contacts in Israel. But the best part of it is I get a call out of the blue from this guy, and he says, hi, my name is Ilya Zerbron. I'm the assistant to the advisor to Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, and he wants to talk to you. So to make a long story short, we ended up connecting with this man who has now given us, um, you know, we've had great favor in Israel. We've met with the Ben Hamin Regional Council there. We've been doing some things trying to start a company to uh, import products from Palestinian occupied territories. You know, all I did was go on a prayer walk. And he puts us in places to change our lives and to lead us and guide us. So the other, the other examples I have to share is just through my, through my work. Um, I work for Procter & Gamble. And <laughs> this is our other daughter, Gianna. Gianna, say hi. Hey, Gianna. <laughs> Gigi. And um, really, in going around the world, uh, Europe and Asia, 
there's always been opportunities to minister. Melissa and I are going to get into a little more of our, our testimony here about how the Lord, you know, propelled us into missions. Um, so we'll loop back around. But basically, I, you know, my first time to India, the Lord had me minister in an area. Um, that I'm glad I didn't know was right next to Pakistan. Yeah, yeah. And the days we were ministering there, there was like no power. The, the country had some kind of like shut off of power for religious reasons, but we had a generator. And then the company that I was doing work with that wasn't even Procter & Gamble gave me a way to connect in through internet. And Melissa was able to basically be there and be part of the service and pray with people and everything. Through Skype. Through Skype, it was amazing. Um, there was another time where the Lord had me in Belgium, ended up going to a church, and at the same time, Abner was at our house ministering on Father's Day, and I went to this church, ended up going to the house of the pastor for lunch and his wife, just through a series of circumstances, and Abner happened to know this pastor and his brother, um, and had been trying to get into that church. So here, God has me not just in that church, but in the pastor's home, Amen. and at the same time, Abner's in my house in the United States. <laughs> so it's just it's just funny. What was the final significance or purpose of that? I mean, it just seems like sometimes the Lord's just saying, I know right where you are. I know your location, yeah. you know? And it was actually at a time, it was kind of funny. Being Father's Day, I'm away from my family. Um, and there's a bunch of stuff going on at our house. But, you know, there was an encouraging word. Um, to fathers that day who were away from their families, and it was just kind of, it's kind of funny how the Lord was speaking to me even in that moment, and saying, you know, where I have you walking, where I have you is right where I need you. Um, there was another time where the Lord had me go to Indonesia. Um, I really didn't make any missions connections or anything, but it just so happened to be I was in Indonesia the week where there was the World Muslim Summit was going on. And the weekend I arrived, there just happened to be an earthquake off the coast of Indonesia. And I think and I actually said the, you were gonna, the, you were gonna experience an earthquake. I like, like heard that. the earthquake before he left. And and so just in being prayer. there, I just realized the Lord had me there just on a prayer mission. It's like, yeah, you can pray for Indonesia from afar, but I'm just gonna put you in the country at the time this is going on, and I'm gonna put you in this location. So a lot of times the Lord has you just walking out your prayers, right? And where he takes you, sometimes he'll have you speak something. Sometimes it's a physical act. Um, sometimes just because you carry the kingdom of God and the favor of God, the people who are around you in that situation are going to experience God's favor um, because God just puts you there as a walking, living testimony of his goodness and his greatness. And we see that many, many times in Scripture, right, with Israel, um, with, with Joseph. It says Joseph was successful. The Egyptian Potiphar saw that he had success. Everything he put, his, put in his hands was successful, so he put him over charge over everything because as Joseph came into his house, the favor of God came on his house. Um, it doesn't say that Joseph preached to him. He talked about his God, that he shared about his dreams, that he shared that he wasn't supposed to be a prisoner because he was the, the son of a wealthy man. Um, it just says that he succeeded and he prospered and so did his master, right? And so in that time in his life, in that season in his life, Joseph was just walking out his destiny. He was walking out his dream. He was walking out his prayer. He didn't think it was. He thought it was part of the nightmare. But he was walking out his journey on the fulfillment of his dream um, of saving Egypt and eventually saving his own family. So um, just be aware. It's just those three ways of there's intentional prayer of going into our prayer closet. There's just the thoughts that come to us. And it talks in the scripture about always being attuned to the spirit and the voice of the spirit. And then there's times where God physically just has you walk stuff out. Um, maybe you're gonna give witness and testimony, maybe not. Maybe you're just gonna shine light. Maybe you're just gonna walk in the goodness and the glory of God and people are gonna see um, the evidence of God's grace on your life. Um, and things will be changed and shifted because you obeyed God. <clears throat> um, so as far as our prayer journey, I wanna share kind of a short testimony, short version of personal testimony of how God kind of launched us on this journey of prayer and ministry as a family. Um, I was about, when I was 30 years old, I experienced some trauma through an auto accident. I actually got hit by a car when I was riding on my bicycle to work. And um, there was a lot of stuff going on at the time, some really stressful situations at work. Um, our third child, Nico, he's not here. 
Um, he was born and he, he was sick like the first month of his life. Um, just like a lot of upper respiratory stuff. And then after that, I began to experience a lot of stuff from the trauma of the accident. Uh, upper respiratory is where it started, but then as I kept seeking medical care, it just cascaded into like different types of allergies, food allergies, environmental allergies. He was and becoming allergic to me. No. <laughs> and so a lot of fear came along with that, right? But as I'll share in a moment here, there was just a lot of other stuff under the surface that the Lord was dealing with. And so through a long journey of going to doctors and looking at natural remedies, when that didn't um, lead to a diagnosis or a cure, I was introduced to two men who ministered healing, prayer, and deliverance. It was actually through a gentleman at my church who said, I got this guy's phone number, and I think he kind of had what you had. And I don't know what they do, but you know, I'll give you the number anyway. So he didn't really believe, right? But he passed the number along. Um, and so when I went and meet with these men, and uh, I received a miraculous healing, and in, in, in some areas, gradual healing, uh, but I immediately was able to eat foods I hadn't been able to eat before. I gained a lot of weight back that I had lost. I weighed about 120 pounds at the time, and I'm, you know, about 190 pounds now. Uh, so that was that was a lot of weight loss. And don't ask me how much I weigh. Yeah. <laughs> and after that point in time, I could give many, many testimonies, but we began to see a lot of deliverance in our family, our children, a lot of healing in our marriage as a result of being part of this prayer and deliverance ministry. Um, we also became part of a church through that relationship because these two men that discipled me um, introduced us to a church. It was an Assemblies of God church where we learned um, about the gifts of the Spirit. Um, we had attended an Assembly of God church in Indiana when I was in college, like 10 years earlier, where I'd received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but then coming back to Cincinnati, I really didn't foster that because we weren't back in a body that, that believed that. But we started a journey right then in around 2006 where we started going to this Assemblies of God Church and really um, just getting bombarded with, with all of it. The conferences, the gifts, um, just getting revelation um, from scripture. And after that point, we had two more children. So Nico was our third, and then we had Gianna and Vitaly um, to even out the number at five for our five-fold ministry. So. Uh, and during that time, I remember praying one specific prayer. I remember, because here I had this issue of not being able to eat everything I wanted to eat and just feeling like I didn't have answers, but I was definitely in the scriptures looking for what God says about healing. And many of us go through different, different journeys, right? Some people, when they have sickness or whatever, they just kind of go into a hole and say, woe is me, this must be God's lot for my life. And for some reason, that isn't what I was thinking. I was, I was just in the word looking for answers and going, God, this is not what your word says. And I had as many people pray for me that wanted to pray for me. But then after this experience of receiving healing through this deliverance ministry, I remember looking back and praying and, and saying, I remember asking God, I want a hunger for your word like I want food. I remember Abner saying last night, like you want water, right? <laughs> you have to want the presence of the Lord and to, to be in the presence of the Lord like you want water. <clears throat> and so I, re I related to that is that I remember praying that prayer. So God fulfilled that prayer. Like I asked him for a hunger for his word. It's not like you can just work something up. Everything you receive from God is a gift, right? Yeah. Holiness is a gift, right? He says, I'm going to give you my spirit. and My spirit is holy. Now, we still have to walk that out. We still have to be obedient. But I just remember asking for a hunger for God's word. And I know the hunger I have for his word is from him. It's not something I worked up in my own emotions or, you know, I have to gear up to read. Um, it's something, you know, just God given. And so this kind of, there are many, many testimonies of healing in our family as a result of that. Um, that, you know, for today, we won't have time to go into. You can come and ask us and talk to us after. But I want Melissa to share now just kind of where we went after that in our, our journey of prayer and, and missions and the Lord kind of leading us into our calling as a family and ministry. Okay, so prior to all this, I really didn't think I needed to pray. I'm just being real with you. 
you know, um, I, I thought, hey, you know, he's God. He knows all my thoughts. He knows what I need. Why do I have to, like, talk to him, you know? And, um, yeah, and then um, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and I'll, I will never forget it because I literally spoke in tongues for three weeks straight. Um, all through the night, all day long, I couldn't stop. You know, my kids, I still probably speak in tongues 35% of my day. Um, I will be, I'll be at the grocery store, you know, checking out, and all of a sudden I'll answer the cashier that's asked me a question in tongues, <laughs> hearing the English in my head, you know, hearing it. And, you know, my kids are all like, ah, just ignore her, she's speaking in tongues, you know. But, <laughs> so, um, I just wanted to share that because it's so important, I feel like, just to speak in tongues, you know. Just, just, you know, throughout your day, you know, just, just speak in tongues. And if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, I would encourage you to go after it. Um, it literally was the coolest thing that ever happened to me. But so it drove me into this place of prayer um, that uh, I, I didn't even know that I was supposed to do. So as John was saying, this was a natural progression in our family. This wasn't like something that we were going after. It was just the Lord just moving on our hearts. And so, I mean, I'm staying up all night, like for days, just going after the Lord and found out about the International House of Prayer in Kansas City, you know, watching it online, um, you know, praying all throughout the night for things, their family, for, you know, just coming into places of travail. And then we decided at our church to have an all-night prayer. So I was like, oh, yeah, this is great. Now I can pray with other people all night long. So we went, I would went to the first one, and I never stopped. You know, I just, we, we would do it once a month, and eventually they saw that I was so crazy hungry, I wouldn't even stop at 6 when it ended. I'd go till 8 or 9, 10 o'clock in the morning. I, w I couldn't even stop. And so eventually they asked us to take it over. And so we started doing so all-night prayer. Was about, this was about the time, like 2007, 2008, when they started having the calls again. Yeah. So they did the call in Nashville in 2007. And so it was around that time that our church was um, getting engaged in the prayer movement. Yeah, and they and at that time they'd actually asked us to become the intercessors at the church to intercessory prayer directors there, and um, we took a hold of that. And and again, truly, it was this this um, place of um, a natural progression. We always in, included our children. I just really would encourage any of you that have younger children that. They are a part, or grandchildren, they are a part of what you're doing. They, they came to all night prayer. Um, they didn't always engage, and that was okay. And most of the time they fell asleep at some point, and that's okay too. But at least that they knew that they were a part of it. Um, we also had times of um, in, um, all night prayer when the kids would lead it. Um, we had um, one group that was doing a thing with Haiti Raising money, for, Raising money for, yeah, for an orphanage in Haiti, and they came, and, and they did the prayer all night long for us. It was amazing. They camped outside in boxes. Yeah, they camped outside in boxes and came inside because it was Something really cold Abner that night. To. Yeah, Abner loves to camp, just so everybody knows this. <laughs> if so if anybody to ever... Church, just get him a tent. Yeah. Just get him a tent. He, want, he wants to camp out. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we need to take Abner camping. Yeah, it's a prophetic <laughs> act, Abner. You have to, you know, pitch the tent on the hill. Anyway, okay. Sukkot's coming up. <laughs> so, you know, our family, w this is something that we began to cultivate, you know, cultivating the prayer in the family, cultivating praying at night, you know, before we would go to bed, we would pray together, you know, and cultivating that place of prayer. And um, one thing that began to happen is um, we had a meeting with our pastor one day. I want to say before that. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so. You um, can have the mic. As, yeah, as we were uh, doing all night prayer, um, you know, keeping prayer going for like 10 hours at night, right? You do a few hours of worship. Uh, you pray over a few list prayer requests, right? But it's really the prophetic intercession that kind of keeps you going. Or you know, the Lord prompted me to get and find out who all the missionaries were for our church. And this AG church had like about 30 missionaries they supported. Getting all their newsletters, emailing them if they don't give us one, finding out their, their on-the-spot prayer requests, right? Writing them. 
Um, and it was amazing because we realized in doing that and then praying over the requests and getting words of knowledge and prophetic words and writing them back, we realized from their response that no one was doing this. Wow. Because there's like, wow, you actually prayed for us and you actually shared with us what the Lord was saying. And, and a lot of it, you hear testimonies from them of how you, know, you were hearing from the Lord that it, that it that gave them breakthrough in different areas. So that just started with just email prayer requests, newsletters, and, and things like that. And so we would spend much of the night you know, praying for missionaries um, as part of that. So. so we had a meeting with our pastor. And on the way there, the Lord said, oh, you should Skype them and pray live you know, for the missionaries, because they were so encouraged by what we were doing. So we get into the meeting, and I'm like so excited, you know, like, you know, I'm real mellow and calm and don't ever like to show my emotion. Um, no, but I was so excited. I'm like, oh, you got to hear this idea. You know, we need to pray. And my husband turns to me, and goes, did you see my email? I'm like, what email? Well, the Lord had dropped it into his heart to do the same thing. And so we began to Skype missionaries from 11, you know, we'd have hour slots all night long. And it was perfect for them because some of them are six hours, 12 hours ahead. You know, it worked out great and would keep us awake. <laughs> and we could, we were praying live with them. And the perf it was unbelievable what was coming out. One missionary after another, and it was a theme. The whole night would roll in themes. And then that would be Friday night. Sunday, church would explode. We would go three, four hours every single time. It was, it was so apparent to us, like we never said anything, mm -hmm. but we knew, oh my gosh, all night prayer at church is gonna be awesome. <laughs> we better bring some food for the kids because we're gonna be staying really late. So, you know, um, it was just amazing what the Lord was doing and um, sure really just that's encouraging. That's mm -hmm. Yeah, so like there would be a theme for the night, right? The Holy Spirit would speak to us about grace or holiness. Oh. Um, there was one night where the, the Spirit was just speaking to us about grace, right? And we were praying into it, and you pray with the first missionary, and it comes out of their mouth. And then every missionary you talk to, the same scriptures are coming up, the same words. Yeah. And there was one night, the last missionary we spoke to, they prayed back to us. You know, we pray for each other. They prayed back to us everything that was said in the previous, like, 10 hours. Scriptures versus everything. You know, the Lord was confirming just what he was doing. <clears throat> just a few testimonies. There was one night we were talking to this, this couple in Mongolia um, where they really can't be missionaries, right? So they, um, the husband was a pig farmer and as a, as a missionary and, and a pastor, and then but the Lord sent him back to Mongolia to be a pig farmer again. So they're raising livestock, and it's becoming, they're training people in agriculture. They're training people who are, are handicapped, who are deaf, in the construction trade, so that's what he's doing is he's helping give people, you know, some livelihood, um, financial financial help through that. His wife teaches in <clears throat> the school. Um, it's a very well-to-do school where all the kids from the parliament go. And she teaches English, but she has them do a journal and journal about things in their life, right, and which is how she basically witnesses to all these kids. And, and so this is how they work there, but they were in need of visas, and there was this crazy story how their visas were blocked up, and somehow someone at the consulate had lost all their paperwork. It somehow got thrown in a trash can, they thought, right? And they had a deadline to get their visas, and they had just applied for like a tourist visa, right? Well, we prayed with them, and literally that week, they called us back and said, not only do we get our visas, we don't know how it happened, we don't know where they found the paperwork, right. but they all got work visas, including their three children. Amen. Right? So, I'm not saying that that's us, right? If anyone had stepped forward and voluntarily prayed for them, right? Um, you wonder if we'd be praying like this as a church, we'd see things like we see in Acts, right? Where, yeah, people are in prison for their faith, but how many prison breaks do you read about in Acts, right? Um, and would, would more of that be happening, you know, if we're praying as a church like this for, for deliverance and victory on the front lines and where people are going? So there were just many, many, many testimonies like that where people just had breakthrough in needs that they had. Um, it was, so it was then out of that, our pastor saw that we were like, loved the missionaries. So he had us become the, you know, mission in charge of missions. And we're like, what? <laughs> this is, this is kind of strange. But what, anyway, what ended up happening out of that is all these different people that we were praying for, we ended up going there on missions trips. So, um, our first one was to Albania 
And I, I really feel like this is what brought me into a place of knowing that this is my life. My life is a life of prayer. But we went to Albania sure and we... how it started with the dream at All Night Prayer. Well, it's a long story. So I just had a dream. The dream was about this uh, prophetic... Um, it was a castle. Yeah. I wasn't going to get into the whole thing. So I had a dream. I was. I had a dream. It was, and there was a castle in the dream, and um, I shared this with our missionary from Albania. And everything in the dream was where he was supposed to do this conference. It was a week conference. Where he was supposed to do it. Who he was supposed to invite. Who he wasn't supposed to invite, and where he was supposed to do it at this castle on top of this high place in Albania. So he he's like, you guys need to go. You guys need to come. So we came. And it was literally, also about there was like a situation in the prophetic community there, and Melissa had a word in the dream about that. So there was so much confirmation for him because he was questioning the location he was supposed to have it because he thought it was a strategic location um, in Albania, and he was asking the Lord for the location, and the answer was in the dream. So then when we got there, we had this meeting the first night with 58, the, 50, the 58 pastors around all of Albania. We did a prayer meeting, and it was at the castle that was in my dream. Wow. It was powerful. Um, but besides that, uh, the woman that was doing that was Sharon Stone. I don't know if you know Sharon. She's a prophet over Europe. And so then she and her husband asked us to lead the intercession for their ministry and we did that for three years and oh my gosh that was training <laughs> that's all i can say i had crazy encounters i mean i i i went with her um to the women on the front line and um one night you know i'm praying all night because i knew she was going to speak the next day and you know you're in intercession when you're in a hotel room now it was a nice hotel but i'm laying on the floor in the bathroom you know you're in a place of travail when you're laying on the floor in the hotel. Okay, in the bathroom. Um, but anyway, I'm praying and um, having these demonic encounters. I mean, these it was it was the wildest thing. I don't even. I'm not going to get into the whole story. But so the next day, I get in the car with Sharon, and she goes, "So how'd you sleep last night?" <laughs> And I go, uh, why? Yeah, I was up all night. I'm having all these demonic encounters. She goes, yeah, I sent them your way. They were bugging me all night. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> Talk about feeling ill-equipped. Uh, that was a crazy night. Anyway, so after that, it was, it was this transition that, uh, you know, led me, met Abner, and then it just kind of naturally, again, just kind of happened. You know, it wasn't like I was planning on interceding for him, you know, and now story. he's, huh? Yeah, so just as Abner shared last night that yeah. the Lord gave him a word to go to that church, we ended up at that church in Youngstown. Where we met. Through a missionary couple at our church who kept telling us, you've got to go to this church in Youngstown to see kind of the apostolic leadership and how they're run. Um, so we had gone there for about a year and a half, and we wanted to go to these leadership conferences. We had missed the one the year before. Um, but we had been going there for a year and a half, and we knew we were supposed to go to these leadership conferences. So all of that came out of this prayer journey we were on, um, connecting with mission missionaries. And as this one missionary couple was telling us, you know, we really feel like you guys need to experience this and go here. And we felt it was the Lord. And so in a very similar situation where Abner shared last night, of the Lord told me to go to this place at this time. We were kind of hearing the same thing through a different set of circumstances. So it's all part of the journey, just hearing, listening, obeying. And a lot of times it is about you need to be in a geographical place at a chronological time, Amen. at a Kairos time, Amen. right? And, and God will make it happen. So we just really hope that our story encouraged you, you know, um, just to know that you can walk out a life of prayer. You are the prayer. You are prayer everywhere you go. I'm going to share. Okay. We got a few more minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the uh, the other part of this was that as much as the roles of prayer in the church, it was actually more common for us to just have people in our home for prayer. I mean, it's like uh, for prayer ministry. A lot of it was couples, marriages. And Melissa did a lot with with home births and, and births and stuff. So, but then we would find I'm ourselves doula. praying with couples, right? <laughs> Who Melissa was taking through the birth process as a doula. Um, but what our kids saw all the time is there's people coming to our house all the time for prayer. 
and the Lord just led us to these, you know, situations. Sometimes it's at church in the healing rooms, but many times it was just people to your living room, right? That's the most comfortable place for people to receive if maybe they didn't want to come to your church, right? Um, the last thing I just wanted to share, and I think this is really maybe speak to the men here, is um, during this time, um, I just got really convicted about my walk and my leadership in my home as a man and all the things I was doing in church because we were just, you hear we're doing these things with missions and intercession and prayer. Um, but when you're a doer in the church, you get asked to do a lot of things, right? Wow. <laughs> and um, there was a time I probably desired to be a deacon, right, or to be in leadership. Um, and not for the wrong reasons, but just probably because I wanted to be around other men um, that I could relate to and men that, you know, I maybe wanted discipleship from or fathering from. I think there was probably like a father, father, spiritual father void there. That's one time in my life. But I read this scripture in 1 Timothy 3, and um, it says, Here is a trustworthy, trustworthy saying, Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well, and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? And that, that verse right there hit me. Now, it wasn't that we had a lot of disorder in our home, but it was just like I could see that in some of the time we were spending on stuff at church, and as much as we tried to involve the kids, I didn't, it didn't need to take on any more. And I just felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to intentionally do things and serve in ways that I tell you where you're engaged as a family and serving together. So we did lots of outreach stuff with the kids and they were out with us serving the elderly in our community, um, doing different things. And um, the other, the other in part of this verse that really hit me, um, that I won't, we don't have time to talk about or get into today, but it says, um, he must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. So that kind of goes into our, our, our testimony in the workplace, right? You've got to have a good reputation with outsiders. So what's your reputation at work? Are you faithful? Are you on time? Are you dependable? When you say you're going to do something, do you do it? Um, if you're a teacher, are you the best teacher you can be? If you're, for me, I'm an engineer. I'm, I want to be the best engineer I can be. I want to be respectful of others. I want to listen to others. I want to encourage others. Um, I want to be dependable, right? People don't see me as, okay, I don't necessarily have a, a scripture screensaver or a Bible open on my desk. Right. But people know, you know, there's a guy at work that's like swore some one time in front of me and apologized, and I've never said anything to him about my faith at all, right? I've never judged him or about, about anything. But it just it goes to say that, what is your reputation outside of church and why? Um, and so I just got really convicted to spend time serving as a family. Um, I determined I wanted to disciple my own children. So I talked about the rites of passage and blessing the next generation, um, which also led to my father coming into that rite and being part of that blessing process. And I could see it was healing for him because he had never received that, right? A second generation immigrant it was always just about work 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 right um, you just do what you're told and you know work to make it and so there was just even a transformation in our family generationally my father being a part of that rite of passage and blessing for his grandsons um, I knew I wanted to model what I preached right so it's not as much about my kids seeing me doing devotionals in the morning as it is when problems happen and problems occur because they do in families that my children see that you know that I have peace that I stay in a place of peace right Amen. then when I mess up you know I can apologize to them for you know how I acted if it you know if I got upset um, so like I said there was a time when I wanted to be a deacon and then later when it was offered to me I knew the answer was no that you know I had direction of what we were supposed to be doing as a family um, Later, I got asked to be in charge of the men's ministry, which I could be capable of doing, but I knew it was, this is not how I'm supposed to spend my time. Um, yeah, Abner's too high maintenance. 
Um, so one example I have of this, and again, I just, I just feel like I want to speak to the men here tonight just about this and just how this whole prayer journey and everything relates to family and just our homes. Um, because so many of us are just really like, our, our, our ministry is in the workplace, right? The marketplace. Most of us, that's where we are, right? Um, so there was a time when our oldest son was nine, Antonio, and I don't know about many of you, but I just didn't have a lot of discipleship in fathering, right? In fathering in a Christian home. But um, thankfully, you know, I, at a young age, I think I tuned my, you know, I was attuned to the voice of God and I, you know, we hear the voice of God. And so there was one time, like Antonio's about that nine-year-old boy age, right? Where he's like, just making a mess of everything, just being a boy, like hitting on his sister, just always just kind of just doing things that just annoy. Yeah, hitting, 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 hitting beat, beating on his sister, whatever, hitting. <laughs> Thanks for the English lesson there, Abner. <laughs> so I was just like annoyed with all these things, and it felt like I was just always on his case, right? And the Lord said, I just heard it very clearly. It was like the Lord said to me, he said, you know, Antonio doesn't need you to be the whole, his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's been convicting men of sin forever, and he doesn't need your help. He's really good at it. And the devil's really good at condemning, and you don't want to be on his team. So your job is to love and affirm him. That's what I want you to do. And it was like, after that, I just started affirming him, and, and it was like all of those behaviors just kind of like stopped, right? Wow. Or maybe I just God. didn't bother me anymore. And I shared this with someone later, and they said, yeah, a friend of mine had a similar experience, and she said it like this. You need to talk to the Holy Spirit more about your children than you are talking to your children about the Holy Spirit. It's not that we don't teach them about God, right? And we don't, it, but the more evidence you have in your life that every situation you face, you're like, but God, right? A situation happens, and instead of declaring and talking about it like it's fact, you say, but God, he'll take care of this just like the last time, right? that they see more your language and how you speak about life. And it's really more about, especially when they get older, it's really more about being attuned to the voice of the Spirit about your kids and what's going on in their life. Because sometimes you just know to go to them and say, all right, just spill it, just tell me. All right, the Lord already told me, but you know, tell me what's going on. You busted. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that with you all that um, it's just been a journey for me just in, in hearing from the Lord about how to disciple my own kids, what they need, um, a lot of times praying, especially praying for, yes, I want to disciple my own children, but I pray for God to send other men into my son's lives. I pray for God to send other women into my daughter's lives, even though Melissa does an awesome job with, with both our sons and our daughters, because they just need other godly men and women in their lives. They're going to give them something, a different perspective that I don't have. And so as much as all the other stuff about praying in the church and for missions and other things, I spend as much of my time, probably more of my prayer time, um, is, is really for my wife and my children and not just their needs, but just that, that God is always in their life, always directing them, always speaking to them, always putting people around them uh, to support them, to mentor them, to disciple them, you know, to be another example um, of following Christ and godliness. So I just wanted to share that to the men here. Um, it was really convicting to me that, you know, I really heard the Lord and balanced, you know, what I was doing and serving because I've just been a doer my whole life. And a long, long time ago, there was a lot of striving in it and other things that I feel like the Lord's really set me free from. Um, and it's really, that's been an awesome journey. As a retired teacher and one who has taught all kinds of grade levels, when you teach your children, do you interweave everything with the Lord in everything they do? Um, one thing that I had to do with my students was, of course, evolution. Mm -hmm. But I would give them evolution as to what the science book said. Mm -hmm. And I would tell them about the tar pits in Texas to which there's actual footprints of a dinosaur with the man's footprints next to it. So either the dinosaur got a meal or the man did. 
So it makes them to think. And this is the way I had to do it because I could not just give them what man said because God, what God says is the most important. So I challenged them that way. When you teach your, your children, do you do as such? So funny What's because he about? was... I told you were supposed to talk about yeah. homeschooling. So I homeschooled. <laughs> I homeschooled my children. Um, Lenore, do you want to answer that question? How, you know... I mean, yes. So I taught them. I, we, God was everything. Yeah. Yeah. The Lord was in everything that we did. You know, um, I really felt like before I even knew what I was doing, that the Lord called us to be in, like a Nazarite family, to be consecrated unto him and to actually separate them out. So not that we were trying to overprotect them because they were in the world. They saw all kinds of crazy stuff but that we did protect them from things like television, what went in their eyes and their ears, you know, um, they were protected from that. And uh, yeah, so um, we taught, I've taught both things. I wanted them to know. Um, they did have a curriculum that they used, but my children read lots of information and knew, you know, how to defend their faith per se, but in love. Because it's not about a debate. It's about, again, what we're talking about. You are manifesting the Lord. You are that presence. You are going in prayer, and you are, you're just being you know, the manifestation of God on the earth. There's one amazing young woman in front of me that hopefully was the fruit of my labor, our labor, who is a missionary going out into the world. She's a worship leader. She's awesome. Pilot. She's a pilot. She's a pilot. So I want to brag on my wife a little bit. Oh, uh, gosh. I, I think one of the greatest ways we teach our kids is just all the teachable moments in life, right? So they, um, you know, they grow up, they become independent, they have jobs, they drive, they have responsibilities, right? And in every decision, every situation, I mean, Melissa's always been there, I've been there, but she's home with them much more, right? <clears throat> so they go to her a lot more for when they have questions and talks, and it's just, Everything in their life, they have a question about just being there to, like you said, teachable moments, right? They have a situation at work dealing with difficult people, working in the fast food industry, right? And it's like, some of them have been pretty complicated, difficult situations where it's like, I think I'm going to get fired because, you know, I just gave a simple opinion about a situation. What do I do? You know, I know you were talking about teaching in certain subjects and evolution and such, but. Well, in the state, every, I think right. every state's different, but in the state of Ohio, I don't have to teach that. So I'm not required to teach that. I can, I can not teach right. any of it if, I know it's crazy, but yeah. Right. So in Ohio, I'm not required to teach those things, but I still did, you know, I taught those things. But what I wanted to focus on off of that question is just that there are so many opportunities and I think that sometimes the best times to teach our kids is right in the situation. Right, I've coached my sons in sports and soccer. It's, just, it's a great opportunity, right? Just to coach about life, life stuff. Dealing with adversity, right? There's adversity on the sports field, right? People don't play fair. People cheat. People try to take advantage of the system. Coaches maybe, are mean. Maybe knock you down. Do you, do you retaliate? Do you go after it? Do you yell at the ref? Do you, you know, what are your words? How do you, how do you, you know, how are you a witness on the, on the sports field, right? in the workplace, right? So they had very difficult situations dealing with other believers in the workplace, right? Believers that we know that we've been at the same church with before, right? They're now their managers not acting appropriately. How do you deal, our kids asking us, how do you deal with that situation? Do I write a letter? What do I say? Um, what do I say at work? When do I speak? When do I not speak? What is my position? How do I submit to authority in this situation where at the same time protecting myself and other coworkers from something that looks like abuse in terms of like abuse of authority, right? So I, I just, when you ask about teaching, I'd gravitate right to just sometimes I think teaching right in the situation, teachable moments are like the biggest way that, you know, and so I'm, I'm happy to say that, and I think a lot of this is because of Melissa, that when our kids have questions, yeah, they go to their friends and they, they ask advice of other people and other mentors and people they have, but I know they come to us and they know they can come to us and ask, you know, ask questions, you know, and continue to be discipled. Thank you. 
as a couple that that does so much in the ministry, how do you all find the balance between family and ministry? Like, how do you balance that? Or I don't know. Did, I'm the brakes. God provide Melissa's a way? the gas. I'm the brakes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seriously the gas. <laughs> She's and the he is the brakes. <laughs> And sometimes the gas has to submit to the brake. No, I'm just, no. Um, I was, was going to no, make a joke out of that. I think, I think you do balance each other, right? There might be times where I'm going, going, going on something. Melissa's like, this is too much right now. You know, we need to focus on Usually this. Usually it's or, the other way around. Usually it is, but, you know, <laughs> not always. Not always, but usually But it I is. think that is part of it. You have your team, right? And so you're accountable to each other. Just um, be together. Do everything together. Have fun. Yeah. But fun, I know fun, for fun. personally, for me, it comes back to that verse, right, of is, do things look like they're getting out of order here, right? Do things look like um, your, your kids will let you know when, when you know. If, they, if they're misbehaving, honestly, if your kids are misbehaving, you know there's an issue and it's you. Yeah. So you need to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Sometimes That's those, how I look those at signposts it. are not the good ones. Yeah, one Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I just pray that everyone in here, in the sound of my voice, would come into a deep place of intercession. That the Lord would begin to wake you at night and that you would begin to hear him more clearly than you've ever heard him before, and that you would go when he says go, and you would stop when he says stop, and that you would manifest his presence in everything that you do say, that when the Lord says go to Walmart, you go to Walmart because he has an appointment for you. And so, Father, we just thank you that we are a hungry people that just want to commune with you and be with you and love on you. In Jesus' name, amen.